Nathaniel W. Martin. Here's Reverend Martin. Thank you. All right, Brother Blackwell, and let me say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, but certainly never good night and never, ever goodbye. It's something I learned from childhood. My name is Reverend Nathaniel Wayne Martin. I'm the pastor of the New Life Institutional Baptist Church here in Los Angeles, uh, California. We're located at 8916 South Main Street and uh, in the beautiful city of Los Angeles, as I've often heard it described. And I would like to welcome you to visit with us on the uh, east side of town. Main Street is the dividing line between east and west uh, L.A. And uh, it's in the south central Los Angeles area. Very colorful area. Very, uh, some say infamous, notorious. But I've always found it a beautiful place to live. And we invite you to come and worship with us at any and all of our services. Uh, we're blessed to be sharing the building, allowed to share the building with our sister church, the Shiloh Missionary Christian Church, of which my good friend, the Dr. Reverend Dr. Della F. Hollinus, is the pastor. And believe me, when the Baptists and the Charismatics get together, there is a shouting in the camp. If you're skeptical, come by and enjoy the service with us. And uh, you'll be glad you did. We'll be glad to see you and pray with you, pray over your situation, your concerns, your conditions, uh, your problems, your prayer requests, and put your name on our prayer uh, request list because God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform and prayer still changes Thing. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. That's the word of God for the people of God. Isaiah chapter 55. I believe around verse 4 or 5 around thereabouts. You can read it at your leisure, but please put it in your heart and put it uh, in uh, your mind that God is a God who is a forgiving and a long-suffering and not willing that any uh, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God wants the best for you. God wants the best for you. God's best is the best. It's the better best than your best. Put yourself in God's hand. However, my brothers and my sisters who are looking at me with my hat on and my glasses and my tie, the purpose of this offering that you are viewing right now is entitled, It's Time. And it's more socio-political because all all. The gospel was always socio-political, uh, but uh, we uh, deal in the business of justice, uh, justice in for environmental justice, uh, justice for economic justice, which must always include and not be limited only, but also include uh, reparation because of the uh, 400 years uh, of that of uh, slavocracy that obtained in this country, although uh, the Civil War was fought over the last two hundred and forty-four or fifty years, uh, give or take, uh, there. But the fact remains that we great, enormous wealth was piled high, as, as uh, Abraham Lincoln said. Uh, even in just those 250 years of unrequited toil, uh, all of the wealth piled by the laborers, uh, by the laborer, uh, but that wealth did not go to the bondman. I used the word laborer. I should have said bondman because you uh, labor, you get paid. We didn't get paid. We were just bond people. And so that wealth... Uh, the gap, of course, was initiated quite naturally if uh, uh, 
I'm work, you got me slaving for you. I'm accumulating wealth for you and accumulating wealth for you and accumulating wealth for you. But what am I accumulating for me? I'm accumulating what? Debt. I'm, a, I'm accumulating poverty. I'm accumulating misery. I'm accumulating uh, a loss. That's all I'm accumulating. I'm not gathering any, any wealth. I have nothing to pass on uh, to my posterity because all of my labor has gone to make you wealthy. As uh, uh, the Bible says, uh, in the sweat of thy brow, brow shall thou uh, eat bread. But the uh, 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, observed that it was turned on his head during the slaveocracy for it, it uh, was meant to read that uh, you sweat, you labor, and I'll eat the bread. <laughs> and believe me, that uh, is what I obtained, and it is not a pretty picture. And it means, it, excuse me, it tends to lend to uh, inequality. And uh, that is what we are dealing with here, an imbalance in the scales of justice that must be uh, recognized, acknowledged, and rectified. And that is what the word reparations means. It means to repair the damage that was done. It means to restore uh, that which was taken away from whomever the uh, person or the entity or the organization uh, may be that was uh, made to uh, suffer the loss, uh, uh, suffer uh, from the depletion or the theft, of uh, that which was lawfully theirs, uh, but which was unjustly uh, taken away from them uh, in the legal sense and, more importantly, in uh, the moral sense. And our reparations scripture that we uh, always invoke is one of them from the Deuteronomy chapter 15, picking up the reading at verse number 12. It says this, please pay attention. And if thy brother, an Hebrew man or an Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him or her go free from thee. And when thou sendest them out free from thee, thou shalt not let him or her go away empty. Thou shalt furnish them liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy winepress of that wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto them. Not just out the winepress so they can stay drunk, no, but out of thy flock, out there with the sheep and the goats and the dromedaries and the camels, all of that, uh, and the oxen, don't forget them big oxen, uh, all of that livestock, you must, what, supply that which is lacking of those who came unto you impoverished, and you have profited out of their uh, labor. God says, thou shalt not let them go away empty. Give them some meat. Uh, of course, the, uh, the livestock mean that they would have something to ride away on uh, and uh, something to, to bargain, to barter, or to trade, or to get back into uh, their own uh, homestead or possession because uh, in God's economy, uh, if people lost their house, they could never be evicted where they could never return. They would have to be able, after the passage of seven years, Excuse me. <coughs> to return home again and reclaim that uh, which was uh, which they had lost. Uh, if you remember in the book of Ruth, there's a beautiful, beautiful story there of uh, Hannah, Naomi, and uh, Ruth, and how that there came up a question of uh, who would redeem the uh, homestead and. Uh, Boaz asked his near kinsman, who was lawfully by right, it was his to redeem. 
But the man said, no, I won't redeem it. I've already, I'm already married. So Boaz said, well, then I will redeem it. And so that, out of that comes the uh, understanding that if you uh, forfeited your property, then uh, you could, under God's economy, not under man's economy, but under God's economy, you would have the opportunity to redeem and to reclaim uh, your land or your property at the end of seven years. It was called the year of jubilee, the year of freedom, and uh, it went. It was uh, it was calculated from uh, seven uh, physical years to seven times seven physical years, which would be forty nine, and then the fiftieth year was the National Day of Jubilee. And uh, that means everybody returned unto their uh, possession. You had to be let, slaves had to be let go free, and the uh, persons who had uh, lost their land for whatever reason would have to be allowed to reclaim and restore to their Land. God, of course, has a far different view of economics from the capitalistic view that obtains now all over uh, the known civilized world. And so we'll put you out your house and see you down there on Skid Row and we'll laugh at you. But in God's economy, it was not to be uh, that way. It was not, I beat you out your house and I'm going to keep your house and you're going to never get your house back. No, you were to release and relinquish uh, that which uh, you had uh, had come into the possession of. Uh, as a matter of fact, in God's economy, if all a poor man had was a, his coat, and you took his coat in the daytime, God said you had to give it back to him in the night so he wouldn't be outside shivering in the cold, uh, God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of leniency. God is a God of the second chance. Far, far different from the criminal justice system uh, that is practiced here. And, of course, we see in our own uh, day that that uh, justice system is still unequal in as much as the people who make the law are above the law. Uh, the policeman can shoot you on the street and go to court and says, I feared for my life. But if you are a homeowner, you are awakened by somebody uh, breaking into your home, you are forced to, to think and uh, to consider, is this because the police are going to ask uh, was he a threat to you? Why did you shoot them? And uh, so you you ha you had to be better than the policeman. Or you got to exercise all manner of thoughtfulness and constraint and restraint and de-escalate the situation. Whereas the policeman, uh, we had a situation here last year. Uh, I won't call the name of the store, but the police were chasing the man, and the man jumped out of his car and run into the store, and people were crowded in the doorway of the store, and the police just, bam, shot. And in shooting at the suspect, they killed an innocent bystander. Why, when I was growing up, uh, it was said that if there was a danger of hitting an innocent uh, bystander, a civilian, uh, that the police would withhold their fire. But no. Police can shoot, but you, in your house, you cannot shoot. You open yourself up to all manner of uh, legal uh, liabilities for exercising the right to protect your home from uh, invasion. I don't want to uh, get too far afield in that, but uh, I do want you to see that there is a huge disparity uh, between those who make the law and those who enforce the law and those who are the subjects of uh, those, uh, those laws. And uh, we see more and more of this uh, growing uh, 
bifurcation, this growing dichotomy, this growing uh, disparity. Uh, we have a lot that's going on in our country uh, this week, uh, this month, and this is the coming up on uh, the end of the month of February, which is Black History Month, and I want to wish all of you a beautiful uh, Black History uh, remuner remuneration, remu rumination, rumination is the word, ruminate. You ruminate, you ponder, you think over, and uh, think back and uh, recall and uh, rehearse the accomplishments and the history of our people, not only in this country, but in the world. Because I was at a, uh, a, uh, Seminar, beautiful seminar too, uh, this week in which they were talking about uh, how uh, Rene Descartes and his ilk, or uh, his group of uh, so called philosophers, spent all of their time down in the uh, libraries, not of Greece, but they spent their time in the libraries of Kemet, or what they came to call uh, Egypt. And uh, in the uh, Theban book, Theban city of Thebes, uh, which was originally Memphis, which they Alexander the Great, who had who conquered uh, that part of Egypt, renamed Alexandria. And uh, but yet the the point is that they spent all of their time uh, studying the the research, studying the writing, studying the findings of the people that they call Egyptos. Uh, and, uh, but the name of the country itself was Kemet originally. But to the victor goes the spoils. Be that as it may, uh, when you quote uh, Descartes, I think, therefore, I am cogito ergo sum. What he's doing is, <laughs> is, is regurgitating what he has learned while studying down there in the libraries and the schools and the universities and the colleges of Egypt. You don't hear me. And uh, that's a part of uh, black history that needs to be very much so made. Uh, you need to be made aware uh, of. And uh, keep in mind, the, uh, uh, because of the fact uh, when I was uh, growing up, we, we had some, we learned some black history, but there were so many other uh, instances and situations uh, in which we were found, we were in, and with which our local uh, so-called white brothers and sisters and learned teachers says, well, the Negro ain't never done nothing in the world. He's never contributed anything, which was uh, one of the uh, excuses, uh, mind you, that was used to uh, justify uh, holding God's people in, in slavery. Uh, but see, when the, whoever is the victor, he's the one that writes the history. As they said, until the lions have a historian, or can write a book, the hunter will always be a hero. Amen to that. Uh, but they were talking about these philosophies and so forth and so on, and uh, how they have uh, impacted uh, learning for the good and for the bad, because we've had a lot of junk science as well as we've had good science. Uh, uh, we've had uh, Copernicus and Galileo, but we've also had uh, Dr. Shockley and that ilk and all of those uh, uh, so-called race scientists who's, who sought to convince the world that there were about six, five or six major races in the world and always put the Negroid race as in the lowest classification of those uh, races. And uh, thank God, uh, because of the hard work of really dedicated 
uh, scientists, not climate deniers like uh, our present uh, presidential incumbent, but uh, people who actually applied their uh, scientific uh, skills and learning uh, to see if, if uh, their theories or their theses uh, would uh, would pan out. And uh, we have a lot to thank them for uh, in that regard, because science means that it was uh, uh, repeatable and uh, replicatable, and the same incident, uh, same result would obtain. Uh, and that's, that's what they call true science, not how many BBs you can put in a human skull, and the, mo the, the skull had the most BB was the smartest. <laughs> but uh, we've had worse worse because uh, we're still coming out of the dark ages as it relates to uh, social Darwinism and many of those other uh, types of uh, applications of uh, the uh, late scientist Einstein's E equals MC square uh, relativity theory theory of relativity and attempt to apply it to society. And did we make a mess of it? Uh, the scripture that I quoted to you earlier, Isaiah 55, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let it return unto the Lord for he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Brings us to the uh, presidential uh, pardoning that is occurring uh, with great abandon, it appears, there in Washington, uh, D.C. Before we condemn old Trump for what he's doing, uh, of course, we are hoping that... Uh, but you know, against all other, all hope that uh, Roger Stone will get a pardon from his from his friend. But we come to find out when I was began to research presidential pardons and uh, what presidential pardon that's a part of ex what you call executive uh, clemency, the power of the executive clemency, and we find out that uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, was quoted uh, as saying that, uh, oh, where's that point? Missing it right now. Uh, why do presidents issue pardon, a special pardon? Oh, here we are. Excuse me. Here it is, Alexander Hamilton in uh, 1788 explained the criminal code of every country partakes so much of necessary severity that without an easy access to exceptions in favor of unfortunate guilt, justice would wear a countenance too sanguinary and cruel. Sanguinary, of course, is a word for bloody, and you understand the word uh, cruel. And so what he was saying, that was one of the reasons why they felt that they would allow for an executive uh, clemency for a president to exercise the the uh, the the uh, power. That's what it is. It's a power uh, to pardon, uh, to commute, and uh, to extend uh, clemency to individuals who had been uh, justly uh, convicted, but. Uh, he would extend what the word pardon or clemency means, which is, uh, of course, uh, mercy. And uh, we find that uh, when we began to look at the stats, the statistic, that uh, the Democratic presidents have uh, used the power of clemency. Remember, clemency means not only just to pardon, but it also means to commute. Now, when you pardon, you make a person like, it, like they were declared innocent before the event or the incident ever uh, occurred. Whereas a commutation, then the, the, the uh, charge or the penalty uh, 
remains, uh, for which the conviction remains, but the the uh, sentence is uh, is much reduced. Uh, which is what uh, Roger Stone is going to get already, because the the uh, the attorneys had asked for seven to nine years, but then came the squawk from the Oval Office. So now Mr. Stone only gets forty months, forty months. That's in other words, three years and four uh, months. And I don't know if he's going to have to serve all of that under the federal uh, mandate, but it used to be federal time was a minimum of five years. You're going to do five years. But here this fella uh, is only going to get three years. And he has uh, undermined, uh, just obstructed justice, what he was convicted of, and uh, all sorts of things. But uh, the danger is that uh, Miss Alice Johnson, who had done, uh, who had given up, been given a life sentence for, uh, uh, for narcotics, given a life sentence. It was her first offense, uh, but uh, and she had already done, I believe, fourteen or twenty-one years in prison from a young uh, teenage woman, and uh, but uh, her case was heard or recognized or came to the attention of uh, Kanye West's wife, uh, Kim Kardashian West, and uh, so happened that she was a good friend of Donald Trump, and she brought this woman's case to Donald Trump, and uh, whatever you think of Donald Trump, he commuted that woman's sentence, and she's out of uh, prison now. She was going to serve uh, a life sentence, but it was uh, commuted by this same <laughs> miscreant, uh, Donald Trump. So you have to uh, exercise some. Uh, uh, you have to exercise restraint when you begin to cry out against these pardons that he's issuing uh, for his cronies. We know they are his partners. Uh, look what Gerald Ford did. He he pardoned uh, Richard Nixon before Richard Nixon could ever go, get to the trial. He said, whatever he's done, he's pardoned. And uh, he also pardoned all the draft dodges. And the part that means that it was like it never happened. So you could, the draft dodges, the war resistance could come home without any repercussion. And uh, Richard Nixon could die a free man, solid, but uh, yet uh, free because he had a friend in the White House. And, of course, those of us who are Christian, we know what it is to have a friend somewhere to help you in a time of trouble. And so all of these things, as, as distasteful as they are, they yet serve a, a useful purpose in uh, many instances, uh, of course, there were many black uh, Black Panthers who we were trying to get uh, President Barack Obama to pardon, but uh, he didn't get around to it. But look how many commutations he uh, issued: one thousand seven hundred and fifteen. Barack Obama, first Black President of the United States, he only issued two hundred and twelve pardons. In other words. Uh, where well, you totally wiped the record out, and when you got out of prison, your slate was clean, you could go get a job, uh, and all of these type of things. But yet, 1,715 uh, commutations, and these commutations were, of course, uh, a lot of them for petty crime, drug possession, possession where the people had been uh, convicted and were going to do life, but... Uh, I suggest that you look at and rethink before we uh, condemn Mr. Trump uh, about uh, what he did. As we wrap up, I just want to mention, I'm not, I got to go, but Wells Fargo got sentenced, excuse me, yeah, has going to have to pay $3 billion for defrauding his customers. You see, the CEO of uh, Wells Fargo, he re resigned, but they gave him millions of dollars 
Now, the little people who were actually writing those things, they got fired. So what am I telling you, my brothers and my sisters, as I go from day to day, on my way, start your own business, open up your own streams of revenue. Don't depend on one source of revenue, open up several. Keep working uh, on yourself, for yourself. Become, on these jobs, if the CEO gets retirement, of 60 billion, 60 million rather, and you only get kibbles and bits. What they're telling you, if they don't want to pay, pay you, don't work for them. God bless. Thank you, Doc.